Welcome back to um, the Accessibility Conversation Series. My name is Elise Park. I'm a licensed professional counselor. And tonight I have with me my friend, Janice. Janice, welcome. Thank you so much for participating. Yeah, happy to be here. Thanks. Yeah, so um, if I could just invite you to share about the industry that you would like to speak into today. Yeah, sure. Um, so I am actually a national board certified health and wellness coach. Um, I have worked in healthcare my entire career. I have a master's in public health in health behavior and health education. So I, I sort of started out with the intention of being a health educator, um, worked sort of in a different adjunct part of healthcare for a number of years, but have always been passionate about health and wellness. Um, it really sort of grew out of my own experience as a young adult, um, learning to take control of my health. Um, and so I always sort of kept my fingers in it, even if it wasn't my primary job, I sort of did it on a volunteer basis. And then I guess it was around the time I turned 40, um, I actually got laid off unexpectedly during the one of the economic downturns. And I thought, you know, this is a sign like I had been thinking about becoming a health coach. Um, and so then I did my training at um, Duke Integrative Medicine in Durham, North Carolina. And um, that's a certificate program. At that time, there wasn't a national board certification yet. So I went just sort of the certification route through Duke. Um, and at that time, I did actually open up my own coaching business. And I sort of did that on the side while I was working part time at another job. And then about three and a half years ago, I was fortunate enough to get the position I'm in now, which is uh, I work for a private company that contracts with employers to help operate employee um, wellness centers, health centers. And, and so I love my job now because it is actually a combination of health education and health coaching, because um, there is a little distinction between those two things. You know, as a health educator, you're really um, you know, teaching people about what you need to do to be healthy. Um, as a health coach, I really partner with individuals to help them figure out what's going to help them become healthy. Um, but I just really love wearing those two hats and being able to do both group educational programs, but then also work one on one with individuals um, as well. Thank you so much for sharing a little bit about your history today. And um, I just have, I'm so interested in learning more. So mm -hmm. um, maybe we can start from, you know, I think it's really beautiful that you took your wealth of knowledge and experience to now partner with people in their health journeys directly one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and so I'm curious, you know, if when we're thinking about immigrants and, mm -hmm. um, sometimes migrants. And then in some cases, they're uh, neither. They're, <laughs> they have um, some kind of visa and they're here visiting. But anyhow, um, no matter what their status is, as far as citizenship and so on, um, internationals and some of whom may be AP, um, Asian, Asian, of Asian descent, mm -hmm. um, everyone has a concern for their health, right? Yeah. So um, when, when we're thinking about those who are encountering this new system and they're out, they're like a fish outside of their normal waters, um, what would you say to help increase um, awareness of your mm -hmm. field for, for, for new people and then and how would you say they might even find a health and wellness coach to partner with them in, in, in their health care? Yeah, no, that's a really great question. Um, because again, I do think this is sort of a burgeoning field, you know, and a lot of people don't always know, you know, what a health and wellness coach does. Um, probably the most popular way that people find coaches is either through, you know, an internet search um, or, you know, some people will ask friends, you know, and, and kind of get a word of mouth referral. Um, but, you know, one of the things that's really important is making sure that you're working with a, a knowledgeable coach, you know, and, and until we had this national credential, you know, it really was 
open season. Anybody could truly just hang a shingle and call themselves a health and wellness coach, you know, and maybe they were self-taught, you know, maybe they just had a passion for health and wellness. Um, but, you know, that doesn't mean they necessarily have had the right kind of coaching training, you know, the true coaching skills. So that's why I'm excited that there is actually now this national directory of um, board certified health and wellness coaches. So they can actually find that information um, on the nbhwc.org website. Um, but again, how would you know to get there? You know, maybe if you Googled, you know, certified health and wellness coach, it could come up. I'll have to try that later and see. Um, so I think it's really important one, you know, for health and wellness coaches in the field to, you know, make sure that word gets out. I've done programs like at the library system you know, just to kind of that are available to the general public, you know, that's a great way to put it out. Um, when I was originally starting my business, you know, I would hang flyers at the grocery stores, you know, um, particularly more the sort of health and wellness geared places like Whole Foods and um, Earth Fair and places like that, where people might be looking for somebody like a health coach to work with. Um, and, uh, but, you know, I, I think that is one of the challenges is figuring out because there's a, a number of different avenues of how you can find a coach. There are self-employed coaches. Um, there are employed coaches like myself where somebody might be able to actually um, receive the services through their employer. Um, and then even now we're starting to see sometimes like physician offices, you know, are starting to partner um, with health and wellness coaches, or even places like gyms and fitness centers, you know, YMCAs, places like that. Um, so there are kind of a number of different pathways to eventually, you know, potentially find a coach. Um, and so we probably have to think about, you know, what is the best sort of marketing and promotion approach for each of those things. Um, but I think if somebody was just looking on their own, um, you know, internet search, or, you know, nowadays, a lot of people use social media, things like Nextdoor, Facebook, you know, and we do have, um, like, I know we have a Facebook group for national board certified health and wellness coaches. Um, but, you know, that's just for coaches in the profession. I'm not sure how many different groups might be out there of just, you know, health and wellness coaches that might be promoting their services. Um, to people in their community. So, but you know, lots of different ways now, you know, with social media that we could get the word out as well. Sure, yeah, thank you so much. That's, um, that's helpful. It makes sense that as a, it's been around for a while from what you've shared with me before, but as a officially developing mm -hmm. credentials type field, it makes sense that um, people can find a health and wellness coach in a variety of ways, but then also um, that acronym that you said, if you don't mind yes. uh, sharing what it actually stands for, that mm -hmm. might be a really great way for people to access somebody who has met certain criteria of yes. um, knowledgeability and staying up to date and, and so on. Yeah. Yeah. So the national organization that credentials health and wellness coaches um, is called the National Board for Health and Wellness Coaches, and it's nbhwc.org. Um, those of us that have passed the exam um, are considered National Board Certified Health and Wellness Coaches. So we're NBCHWCs, which is a mouthful, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's a great place to start. And um, you know, for anyone who might be interested in pursuing that path, I think the cool thing about being a health and wellness coach, um, you know, to me, probably the most important thing is that you do have a passion for health and wellness. Um, you know, you yourself, but also wanting to help others, you know, be able to improve or optimize their health. Um, but you don't necessarily have to have, you know, a background or even, you know, a degree in healthcare. I remember when I went through my training, um, you know, we had a gentleman who was from the IT world, you know, who just, he had had some health problems himself and that sparked his interest, you know, in taking care of himself. And then he realized like, oh, I can help others do this too. Um, but right now to be able to sit for the national, um, board certification, um, you do have to have either an associate's degree or higher, but again, it doesn't have to be in healthcare. 
Um, or you have to have about 4,000 hours of work experience. And I think they are probably looking for, you know, work that is related to health and wellness. Um, and then you have to um, have essentially graduated from one of their approved coaching programs. And I looked and there's about 75 programs that have been approved to date. Um, some of them are actually academic or degree programs, you know, where you can either get like a bachelor's or a master's degree in health coaching. Um, others are more a certification program like I did, where it's more of a um, supplement maybe to whatever kind of background you already have. And then you do have to have at least 50 um, health coaching sessions kind of under your belt before you can actually sit for the exam. I remember I had to keep a log, you know, when I was doing my um, initial coaching in order to get a certain amount of experience before I could sit for the exam. That's really, really helpful information for those who may be interested in um, entering the field and curious about where to even start, you know, especially if they want to do it in a way that, um, you know, out of concern for the public having trust in yeah. their background. So that's really great information. I'm, I'm curious, um, you know, it being a, I don't want to, I don't want to say developing field, but the, the credential itself gaining some ground, right? Mm -hmm. um, and structure to it. I imagine, please correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. I imagine that it may be challenging to find a supervisor or a consultant to work with that can um, help, help an individual own, hone their skills um, for those 50 hours, for example, that you mentioned, or mm -hmm. um, during, the during their degree program if they want to i don't know learn a certain way to make sure that they're really uh putting the client first and and working with them alongside them um and not blurring any lines um right. i i I'm, my assumptions might be wrong so please correct me if i'm wrong yeah how, how do people find the appropriate mentor yeah you know that that's a great question because i i remember um you know it, it's been about six, seven years since I went through my coach training. And, and, you know, I've had individuals reach out to me through my private business when I had it saying like, you know, could I shadow you, but you really can't. I mean, you would know this as a counselor, like there's patient confidentiality and privacy, you know, so unfortunately it's one of those fields where you can't really have somebody shadow you for a day, at least not in sessions. Um, I, I believe the way most people um, I know in the program I went through, we had to, um, when we actually started coaching, um, we actually had to record some of our sessions, obviously with the client's permission. And then we had what was called supervision, where we were assigned, you know, um, someone from the program, one of the fac faculty, if you will. Um, and then we would listen to the recording and then they would provide feedback. You know, this is what you did well. This is where you could have improved. You know, do you see where you could have asked this question when they said this, that kind of thing. So I believe most of the approved coaching programs have that type of supervision so that, you know, you're not just out there on your own, especially as a brand new coach, um, as you're trying to build your hours to sit for the exam, you know, wondering, am I doing this right? Am I asking the right questions? You know, so, um, and then I would say, since you, you wouldn't be able to really sort of shadow a health and wellness coach, but it can be really helpful to maybe just do like an informational interview um, to learn more about what is the day-to-day -day work like. And, it, and it's going to look very different if you're a self-employed coach, you know, maybe versus someone like me who's employed in a health center um, versus someone who might work at the YMCA or a fitness center. So it might be good to actually talk to um, coaches in different roles to understand, you know, what their days are structured like. Um, but I think you can get a pretty good sense of it just from, you know, having a conversation like this and being able to ask questions about what type of, um, you know, focus areas do clients want to work on? You know, what are some easy things to work on? What are some more challenging things to work on? Um, you know, what do you do if somebody's not making progress? You know, obviously, if these people are paying you to try to improve their health, 
um, but they're struggling, you know, and they're not making changes that can get kind of sticky. Um, so I think, you know, even just meeting over coffee, you know, with a coach um, or something would be a great way to really learn more about it. Yeah, that, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So it sounds like for the client's confidentiality, the industry is from the get go, mm -hmm. it's as confidential as possible as private. And that means that there may be some limitations to how much shadowing per se could happen. Yeah. But people are accessible and can talk about how they do their own work. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all coaches, whether you're self-employed or employed, um, pretty much fall under all the HIPAA um, regulations and things like that. So the same kind of patient confidentiality, privacy, you know, um, standards that we have throughout healthcare. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you a, a common question that I get. <laughs> yeah. Just to, just to hear, you know, how a health and wellness coach, certified coach, Mm -hmm. describes this and um you know for for the those who do end up watching this video so how would you differentiate or define yourself apart from others other types of professionals that may speak about similar things mm -hmm. um so whether that's like oh how are you different than my um my primary care doctor, how are you different than my OBGYN? How are you different than my psychiatric nurse practitioner who does my medications? How are you yeah. different than my therapist or my social worker? How are you different than a psychologist? Um, just a couple examples, right? Yeah. Or how are you even different than my chaplain? Um, right. <laughs> Good one. Yeah. In the hospital. Um, right. Yeah. So how would, how would you describe that? Yeah, no, that's a really great question. Um, I think the biggest difference and, and what I usually tell the clients that I work with is, you know, in the traditional sort of healthcare experience, your doctor, your nurse practitioner, um, uh, even things like your personal trainer, other nutritionists, most of those individuals come into an appointment wearing their expert hat, you know, they are experts in medicine, they're experts in, you know, nutrition, they're experts in exercise physiology. Um, and they're often paid to tell you what to do. Um, coaches are different because we don't tell people how to be healthy or healthier. We really sort of come into it as a partner. Um, and yes, you know, we do bring expertise in behavior change. Um, we basically are trained to ask powerful questions that a lot of people have never maybe thought about before, you know, really tapping into their values, their motivation, you know, what's important to them about their health, um, what their strengths are, you know, what their challenges are, how can they utilize those strengths, you know, to overcome those challenges. Um, so that's why the biggest difference is that it's a partnership and, you know, more of a, you know, cheerleader, although I hate to, in a way, minimize that because it's really more about providing support and encouragement and really providing like a process and a structure. You know, a, most people know what to do to be healthy, but they have trouble, you know, implementing it. Um, coaching can really sort of provide a structured process of how to do that. Um, and then you know, we definitely have limitations. Like I live in North Carolina and like I am legally limited in what kind of nutritional information I can provide. So I always tell people we can talk about sort of general healthy eating habits um, and I can help you maybe figure out how to eat more fruits and vegetables, you know, if that's one of your goals. Um, but like I cannot design you know, detailed menus or meal plans. I can't tell you how many carbs or proteins, you know, you should be eating because that's outside the scope of my practice. Um, same thing, you know, I'm not trained in, um, I'm not a personal trainer. I haven't had that kind of expertise training. So I can help you figure out 
how are you going to fit exercise, you know, into your schedule, but I'm not going to tell you what you should do to exercise. And I can't really come up with, um, you know, sort of a weightlifting plan for you, because again, that's sort of outside of the scope of what I was trained to do. I think that's really beautiful. You know, <laughs> actually meeting somebody in healthcare who, like you said, wears the expertise hat mm -hmm. and tells you this is the diagnosis, therefore X, Y, Z is needed, can be a little bit overwhelming for a lot of mm -hmm. people. Making a visit to the doctor, to the therapist, sometimes needs like just a day of like its own day to yeah. <laughs> take in the information, to be gentle to yourself, et cetera. And um, having someone there that is there to support you um, can be really helpful to take those next steps after receiving those directives. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think that's really cool. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, you know, I at one time when I actually started my coach training, um, I was a practice manager for a primary care physician. Um, and, you know, it was just eye opening because, you know, we obviously spoke closely every day. She used to be my physician before I went to work for her. Um, but, you know, I could just hear the frustration in her voice when she would come out of, you know, an appointment that say was for an annual physical. Um, and, you know, maybe it was somebody that was 20, 30 pounds overweight. And so their blood pressure was a little high and they were borderline, you know, pre-diabetic and, and she would sort of tell them, well, you know, you need to exercise and you need to eat better and you need to make sure you're sleeping okay. Um, but she didn't have time to get into, okay, how are you going to do those things? You know, as a working mom with three kids and, you know, um, so, you know, she, she could see the limitations of even a primary care model um, of just the way that, you know, our health system is structured and the limited time, you know, that healthcare providers have with their patients and what they're reimbursed for, you know? Um, so she would just kind of be like, you know, here's your checklist and good luck, you know, as she sees them out the door. Um, and so, you know, in many ways it was nice because she did actually refer people to me, you know, for coaching sort of privately, um, if, you know, if they were open to wanting to work with someone to help them figure out, okay, how am I going to make these changes so that I can improve my health? So, and that was really nice, you know, when we had um, clients in common because, you know, we always asked their permission so that we could talk, you know, and, and I could share what they were progressing on with coaching and, and she could share information, you know, from their medical visits. So, you know, it really is a beautiful partnership. I think every you know, primary care doctor's office should have a health coach. Like that would be a wonderful thing. Um, and then that actually brings me to another point. You know, one of the barriers right now for people in working with a health and wellness coach is cost because we are not licensed yet. We're working on that. You know, I think at the national level, trying to make sure that we can move to the point where we can be considered, you know, billable services, whether we're working, you know, maybe under a physician or nurse practitioner, or even as a self-employed coach. Um, so, you know, right now people have to pay out of pocket for coaching. Um, and, you know, for some people it can be cost prohibitive. Um, you know, I really love the fact that because I'm an employed coach, you know, it's considered an employee wellness benefit um, for the organization, you know, that we contract with. And so they get all of it for free. And, you know, and it's amazing how some people don't really understand what it is, you know, until they try it. And then they're just like, this is incredible. And I can't believe I don't have to pay for it, you know. So that's one of the things that, you know, has been a barrier for some people. But I do know, you know, some coaches will, you know, either offer like a sliding scale. Um, others, uh, depending on people's health insurance, sometimes you can use either like flex spending or, you know, health savings account um, money if you have one of those kind of accounts. Um, so there are different ways you can navigate around it, but there is actually work being done right now. Um, they're doing sort of a pilot program of um, procedure codes for health coaching, but I understand it can take, you know, anywhere from like three to five years before it really becomes um, primary codes that could be billed through insurance. 
Yeah, so that's actually really helpful to know as far as accessibility goes. Um, like thinking of the AAPI community since mm -hmm. it's a, you know, a project motivated to help the AAPI community. Um, for those that are self-employed or they don't have, where they don't have health insurance, mm -hmm. uh, it may be cost prohibitive. And for those that do have um, EAP programs through their employer, there may be some options. So that's really yeah. great for the consumer side for the, um, for the career hopefuls, for that yes. side. Um, I'm curious if, um, you know, if there are currently any direct opportunities available in your industry to empower AAPI, for example, is there a diversity network of leadership? Um, how much AAPI representation would you say there is in, in the top level C-suite mm -hmm. to speak? Are there scholarships for AAPI to enter this industry? I'm, I'm just curious, you know, for, for those that would want to work in it. Yeah. Anybody? Yeah. No, again, um, great question. And as I mentioned, um, you know, just being approached about doing this interview really has increased my level of awareness about how no, like the AAPI community, I think is very underrepresented, you know, in the health and wellness coaching field. Um, and even just taking a deeper look into, gosh, you know, all of the staff at NBHWC, you know, I'm not seeing that level of diversity or on the board of directors as well. Um, so, you know, I'm really motivated to reach out to them. I know last year um, when we were sort of in the, um, the heat of a lot of the social justice movement, um, you know, last summer, they did put out, you know, a statement, obviously, um, indicating that, you know, they're fully on board with fighting, you know, social injustice. But, you know, I felt like that was geared more towards probably the African American community. So I think, you know, we need to reopen the conversation and say this needs to be broadened, you know, to include, um, you know, a much more diverse um, community of individuals. Um, and again, I think part of it is, you know, we talk about individuals from maybe, you know, underrepresented um, communities needing to see others, you know, that look like them or have similar cultures, you know, potentially in these fields that they want to work on. So, um, you know, I'm curious to do sort of a deeper dive, you know, even within like our Facebook group, um, because I feel like when I just think in my head of, you know, the cohort that I was in when I did my training, um, I, you know, the field is definitely dominated by white women. I mean, that, that seems to be uh, the primary uh, sort of cohort of individuals that are interested in health and wellness. Um, but obviously we need to have broader representation, you know, in the field itself in order to reach, you know, communities that might have a need for these services. So, um, you know, I'm really interested in kind of getting that conversation going a little bit more at the national level too. That's a beautiful intention, which I really mm -hmm. appreciate. And yeah. um, that kind of leads to a question in my mind of how accessible do you feel the leadership is even to you, um, you know, for basically, I don't know what the appropriate word is. I want to say constituents, but it's not constituents. Mm -hmm. Right, <laughs> it, right. Like yeah. others who are licensed, right? Um, and members in, in, the, in the field. Um, would you say that there's open communication? Um, how accessible do you feel they are to? Yes. Um, yeah, I think they're very open. Um, you know, it's a small group since this is sort of a relatively new organization. I think there's only maybe four or five people on paid staff um, and then a, a larger board of directors. Um, but, you know, the paid staff is quite responsive, you know, to emails, phone calls. Um, they uh, facilitate the Facebook group that we have and, and like they're on there, you know, and they respond to things pretty quickly. Um, the other thing that's really nice is I believe, I know at least the executive director, but I think most of the other staff, if not all of them, um, are coaches themselves. You know, th they sort of, live and breathe this work as well, which I think is important. 
um, so they understand it, you know, from their own perspective of having worked with individuals as well. Um, but one thing I forgot to mention, uh, just going back to your previous question, um, you know, about like potential scholarships and things like that. Um, I think that's probably going to vary based on where somebody does their training. But I know like when I went through the Duke program, they did have some scholarships available, you know, for individuals that would need financial assistance to cover the costs, you know, of the training. So, um, and I imagine that we might see more of that as these programs, you know, strive to try to make the field more accessible um, to maybe, you know, individuals and communities that haven't been represented in it as much. That's awesome. I, I love the, you know, the level of like aware, self-awareness as a field that they want to support new people that want to come in, um, in general. And, mm -hmm. and also, um, that the executive, the, the national leader level that folks are coaches themselves, you know, it just brings a level of authenticity to the conversation because mm -hmm. they get it. Um, so I, I'm, I'm very, you know, I just think that's wonderful. And, yeah. um, that makes me wonder, um, well, I guess I'm wondering a couple of things. <laughs> <laughs> I just think this is a really cool conversation. So it's making me think of a couple of different things. So um, I, I wonder, the first thing that I wonder is, um, given that it's kind of this, like, it's this field that is, creating its national presence mm -hmm. um would you say sorry <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> recording at home so um so would you say that your um field is also developing kind of like groups that are um working on or or position to self-advocate um and have some clout in the culture like if I make a, a metaphor, the social work, um, you know, social work, national organization of social workers, they are very strong in representing mm -hmm. their interests and their concerns and, and okay. using their voice, right? So I'm curious if um, health and wellness coaches are also kind of developing that kind of a, an organization that new, newly credentialed folks can join and have um, a community of like my yeah yeah you know that's a good question um I think right now that's relegated more to sort of like our Facebook group um and then I've been hearing murmurs because I have to admit I'm, I'm not on Facebook very often but uh this new I don't know if it's new it's new to me the whole clubhouse thing um which I think there are some coaches that have created their little community on Clubhouse. Um, and then of course, you know, LinkedIn, since that's more of a professional, you know, networking. Um, but, you know, I'm curious to see, cause you're right, I've had, I've had other certifications where, you know, we do sort of have more of a professional membership. I don't know that we quite have that, you know, we're all national board certified health and wellness coaches, but um, we don't necessarily have like a, dues paying organization, you know, yet. And I think that might be because the field, you know, is still relatively new and it's probably going to take somebody to step up and take the lead on, you know, developing that, but that's a great idea. Um, one thing uh, that did come to mind when you were sort of asking that question was, I do know, like when I was looking at the coaches that um, are in the national directory, um, some of them have indicated sort of what their um, areas of expertise are or their um, specialty, because, you know, there are some coaches that just are like, I'll coach anyone. And then some people come into it much more like, I want to work with women, or, you know, I want to work with um, individuals that have dealt with trauma, you know, so you can in a way specialize, you know, in particular types of clients that you work with. Some people want to work more with, you know, young adults. We don't do a whole lot with children for the most part. It's a little 
you're getting into a little bit of touching territory there, but, um, you know, younger adults, some people want to work with older adults, you know, help with like healthy aging. Um, so I'll be curious to kind of go back and look through that directory and see if there is anybody that has indicated that they maybe want to work with, um, you know, either people of color or other, you know, um, communities like that. So that'll be interesting to see if there are some that have self-identified. And I really think I'm going to tap into our Facebook group as well. Like, I think I want to try to find out um, in our group, because I think we're up to 5,000 certified coaches. They just had the most recent um, cohort that took the exam. And I think we just passed that milestone. Um, but I would love to just put a query out there of, you know, how many coaches, you know, do identify as AAPI um, and, you know, what their thoughts are on how do we make the field more accessible to that community. Thank you. So yeah, um, I have so many more questions, but <laughs> for the purposes of this interview, I'll just have one more. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, so this project, you know, it was inspired or rather motivated um, as a response to the increase of anti-Asian um, hate behaviors yeah. and rhetoric uh, during this pandemic. And um, it's kind of been like a slow boil, you know, mm -hmm. just like escalating, escalating. And then with the recent murders in Atlanta and other ex situations like in New York. So anyhow, um, I, I just want to invite you to share any, um, any personal thoughts or reflections that you've had in, um, in the wake of the deaths and the, and the, and the harm that mm -hmm. our culture has experienced, um, you know, cause, well, I, I say it that way because I feel like when one person or one party in a family system, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, is hurt, then everyone else is inevitably affected by it. Um, kind of like the butterfly effect. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, you know, people may respond differently and react differently, um, but everyone's affected. So mm -hmm. um, just want to invite you to, to share your thoughts as a friend and um, as an ally in solidarity, um, if you want to share. And you oh, can yeah. Share as little as you want. I, I don't oh, want to yeah. put you in a weird spot. So. Oh, no, no, I appreciate that fact. And, you know, of course, um, just sickened, you know, and disheartened at what we are seeing. Um, and, you know, even just we, you know, we had um, an event here in our community in the last week where, um, two different individuals, one of whom I believe was AAPI, um, you know, were verbally um, sort of attacked and then also had like a water bottle thrown at them, you know, on a greenway through, you know, just out on, na on a nature trail. Um, and, you know, the community is sort of in an uproar because the, uh, the police department has determined that it wasn't, you know, uh, racial, racially motivated because apparently the gentleman um is mentally ill and it's like well that's not an excuse you know like uh, you know somebody actually caught it on camera and um you know they didn't go into a lot of detail because of course it sort of falls under HIPAA they can't really say what his mental illness is or something um but you know that was so frustrating to me I was like clearly this person attacked two people that were quote-unquote foreign to him um, and to, you know, just have law enforcement respond that way with, when there's been backlash, you know, I, I feel like even their explanation has left further questions to how they came to that, you know, determination. Um, and then, of course, you know, I saw the video of the woman in New York City mm -hmm. that was, you know, attacked with security guards watching who did nothing, nothing to intervene. Yeah. And it's like, where is your humanity? I mean, like, what happened to just caring for your fellow man? You know, it really is sort of um, just making me question, like, what has happened to our society? You know, especially after, 
you know, with the whole year last year of the pandemic and all of this talk about people being isolated and, you know, not connected with one another, but it's like, but has it turned us into monsters of us? Like what in the world, you know, it just really um, has been puzzling, you know, to me. Um, but, you know, one thing I did want to share was um, through the fellowship that Sarah and I belong to, um, I was finally able to do this anti-racism program that they had, um, you know, which of course was created and is geared more towards the African-American community. Um, but I was fortunate that in our small group, because there was sort of a large group that goes through it and then they break you into small groups. Um, and our group, we did actually have... Um, a woman who identifies as Asian American. Um, and it was so eye opening just for her to share stories, you know, of the discrimination she's experienced. Um, and really, it was, it was um, a great learning experience for me to understand, you know, she said, people don't realize that the question, where are you from, is so insulting, you know, because she's like, I'm an American, you know, just like you, because she, you know, she was born here, maybe her, you know, parents or grandparents weren't, but she was like, you don't ask anybody else, where are you from, you know, and I think so many people think that's just an innocent question, you know, if they see someone that maybe looks Asian, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that is an insult. Why would you wouldn't ask me where I'm from? Because I look like this, you know, why would you ask anybody else? So um, I felt so fortunate, you know, to have her in our group and really sort of understand. And I think that was when it came to my awareness that, you know, all of these anti racism efforts need to be more than just, you know, for the African American community. There's so many other. Um, cultures and communities that need to be part of that because I, I in a way feel like the Asian American community has suffered through this silently you know like I feel like we really haven't heard until we've now reached this boiling point where people are getting physically attacked and killed and it's like but that probably was happening all along yeah but nobody was really shouting about it, you know, or right. calling attention to it as much as we have all of the, you know, attacks and murders in the African-American community. So, um, you know, I, I hate that it's gotten to this point, but if this is what it took to really sort of open people's eyes and, and recognize that mm -hmm. there are many more communities within our country that you know, need to have the same type of support um, and resources, you know, when it comes to um, stopping, you know, this behavior. Yeah. So. Um. Janice, thank you so much for sharing. Oh, you're welcome. I mean, I just really appreciate how much you've put, you know, thought and preparation into this interview mm -hmm. so that your field can be more accessible for AAPI consumers and AAPI um hopeful to be professionals in your yes. field um and also just sharing from the heart about you know your reflections i, I just really appreciate your time so yeah, you're um, welcome yeah with that we'll just uh close this interview and for those who are watching stay tuned for the next one